today, she had to answer for herself at a Commons committee with difficult questions about whether she knew immigration enforcement was causing injustices, and if not, why not, when warnings were given as early as 2016. She also faces the challenge of sorting out the Home Office. She accepted a culture change needs to occur there. Now, if you're writing a memo to Amber Rudd on what to do now, you'd have a lot to discuss. Should concessions to the Windrush arrivals be extended to many more people? Should there be a full amnesty for anyone who was here, say, 10 years ago? That was reportedly an argument in Cabinet yesterday. Should the hostile environment policy be watered down, abandoned, or simply applied with more discretion? And then your memo would need to address the rawest issue of all should there be a new Home Secretary to implement it all? It is, after all, often better for there to be a fresh start. Well, our policy editor, Chris Cook, hasn't written a memo on it, but he has made this report for us. The Windrush generation are Britons, who arrived in Britain from British colonies prior to 1973. So why have they suffered so much at the hands of the British government? That was the key question today for Amber Rudd, the Home Secretary, when she was grilled by the Home Affairs Select Committee. Can I ask you, when did you become aware of the problem? Um, I became aware over the past few months, I would say, um, it, that there was a problem of individuals that I was seeing. Uh, this was covered, as far as I could see, from newspapers and MPs bringing it forward anecdotally over the past three or four months. And I became aware that there was a potential issue. I bitterly, deeply regret that I didn't see it as more than individual cases that had gone wrong that needed addressing. I didn't see it as a systemic issue until very recently. One former immigration minister is puzzled at how long it took to notice. I think the Home Office and government has handled the situation appallingly. They must have seen the media reports. They had letters coming in from members of parliament. Ministers replied to those letters, the immigration minister and the Home Secretary. They could see a pattern of what was happening, that people who had spent virtually all their adult lives here, given so much to our economy, so much to our public services, were being treated in a really disgraceful way. In any case, earlier today, the Foreign Office confirmed that in April 2016, as part of its regular ministerial dialogue with Caribbean partners, FCA ministers were made aware of concerns about some immigration deportation cases. And a core function of the FCO is relaying concerns raised by partners with us to the relevant parts of government. In April 2016, of course, the Home Secretary was Theresa May. We also learn that some huge questions remain unanswered, like how many people have been wrongly imprisoned? We need to know if the state has wrongfully incarcerated people. I agree with that, but I mean, how, how far back would, would you suggest, for instance, that we should go? Like we certainly need to know about the last few years and I think, you know, to go back as, as far as is reasonably possible. We don't know, we don't know how many people have lost health care. Um, I don't, uh, it, it's difficult for us to work out whether anybody individually has been affected by applying for uh, support in a hospital and has or hasn't had uh, the service that they need given to them. There is a lot that we still don't know about. We don't know how many Britons have been locked up or are stuck, exiled far from home as a result of this scandal. We don't know who knew what when in the Home Office. We also don't know what it will take to fix this. That is to say, we don't know whether it's possible for the Home Office to be as aggressive as it has historically been while making a few administrative tweaks to make things work, or whether our immigration department needs a fundamental change to the way that it looks at the world. Just consider the demands being made of people to prove they've lived in Britain since 1973. And we've also heard that people are being asked for four different pieces of proof for each year. Do you have four different pieces of proof as to where you were living in 1989? Millions of people are affected by this guilty until proven innocent attitude, including now EU migrants. So the Home Secretary has called for a culture change in her department. But she wouldn't say today who is to blame for the current Home Office culture. Her? 
or her long-serving predecessor. Chris Cook there, we will discuss that in a moment. But meanwhile, decisions do have to be taken about individual cases. Home Office officials have been told to think about the individual, not the policy. Well, interesting cases uh, that are distinct from Windrush are emerging. And here's one now. Um, We've taken a tough line on immigrants as a nation, but what about asylum seekers? We have spoken to one today. She's 19. She lives in Bristol. Her application for asylum was refused, but is being appealed. Now, she came here as a child, age 14, from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And a new rule, which took effect only this year, prompted the Home Office to tell her that she was not allowed to sit her A-levels this summer. Under the rule, new conditions were imposed on some young asylum seekers on their right to study, even if they'd already been in school uh, for years here. Well, these cases are often twisty, uh, twisty, and on Monday... Uh, the woman you're about to see was granted a temporary reprieve to continue her studies, thanks to the High Court, no less. Being an asylum seeker, she fears persecution if she returns home, and because of that, we're not showing her face or naming her. She's been speaking to Phil Kemp. I remember my um, head teacher used to call me a superstar, because on that time, my English was very, very bad. The only thing I can say was, OK, and no, but... Now, you know, I can speak and, yeah. I have won a reward in my college for being, um, um, for having a good uh, conduct and uh, good behave, behaving in the school. So when did you first hear that there might be a problem with you going to college and sitting your exams? So I was just preparing my exam, my first exam for health and social care. Then reading that letter was like, why what is this but my college was like no why they they ask you to stop just on the way like this you have like three more um maths to finish my teachers was really upset especially my health and social care teacher because she's the one who was like helping me for my exam i started health and social care with um, a grade c and now i'm aiming a b or a so she was like, why, why now, why? But we didn't have a choice, really. I'm not a student who's like making trouble or being in the police or those kind of things. But I'm, I'm really polite. If you tell me stop, I will stop. If you tell me carry on, I will carry on. And um, telling me to stop studies for me was a bad decision ever in my life. I've been waiting for four years already which is long and uh, to tell someone like to hold on with her studies after four years for me is a wrong decision because of this situation i think my grade will come down we drop down which is a bad thing for me so yeah well that's one case from Bristol. We did ask the Home Office to comment, and they told us that the case is ongoing, and if someone disputes the study restriction on their immigration bail, they can contact the Home Office to consider removing the study restriction. So let's take stock uh, of this with two MPs, Chris Philp for the Conservatives, Nash Shah, Labour MP, and a member of the Home Office Affairs Select Committee, which quizzed Damba Rudd this afternoon. Very good evening to you. Let's just start with that case. Chris Philp, what's your view of... Clearly, a rigorous enforcement of the rules and a new rule that says you can't study here if you're an asylum seeker on appeal. Um, You can't take your exams. Does that seem fair to you? Well, I think you need to look at the individual circumstances to be able to make that judgment. I think if someone is in the country illegally, and I'm not saying that was the case um, in the case study we just saw, um, you know, I think it's reasonable to say that access to things like education, which is very expensive, should be restricted. Now, because if someone comes here illegally, then why should taxpayers pay for them to receive services? Now, the case we just saw was on appeal, and I can see that after um, High Court review, they decided that while somebody lodges an appeal, um, they should have access to education. And I must say, at first glance, and I've only just seen the case, um, that does seem to be reasonable, that while someone appeals, they should be able to access education. Yeah. But of course, that wasn't a Windrush case we just saw. No, 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 it's not. But this and is the we- point, is, is that... Is that when now we've had a glimpse mm. of what hostile environment <laughs> means, we're seeing that there are just going to be lots and lots of different examples of the way in which it's being applied. And I'm, I'm interested in whether you're kind of uncomfortable to see that we've said to someone who's been in school, oh, look, you've got, you know, two months to your A-levels. Stop, mm. you can't study anymore. Well, it sounds like the High Court decided that, that right. the rules had right. not been correctly applied, and I would, my instinct is to agree with the High and Court. You wouldn't, you, you wouldn't really want 
an average asylum seeker to have to go lawyer up and get judicial review at the High Court to kind of enforce that, would you? Well, if their application was still live and hadn't been finally decided, no, you wouldn't. But if someone's here illegally or has had their application definitively rejected, then I think it is reasonable to say um, they can't access services. And, and if you're talking about the wider issue of illegal immigration, of course... Then you would say of course the you don't get the right. And of yes. course the Windrush cases are not illegal. They have every right to be here. But if someone's here illegally, I think it's quite proper that they don't access benefits, they can't access services, and they ultimately face deportation. That's only fair because without that, the immigration rules mean well, then nothing. You, yeah. Now, Sean, I'm, I'm interested in your view of to how far you think we should extend, if you like, concessions, extend a less hostile, a non-hostile environment. Everybody? Or do you think there's some, you know, this case here, what would be your view of that? Well, in this case here, this isn't the, the only case. that my, my constituency deals with many cases every, every week. We have about 15. And I can tell you that the amount of mistakes that we get, this asylum seeker to have to go to judicial review for what, were, what should have been really, really simple case-by-case -case basis clearly hasn't worked. And what this demonstrates is, in addition to Windrush, that it's not just an issue of Windrush. There's an actual systemic failure within the Home Office in dealing with cases. Right, but we, do you agree that we do have to... Do you agree we have to enforce some kind of border and that means you have to be tough on some people who simply aren't allowed to be here, even though their cases, by the way, may be deeply sympathetic in person. I, I absolutely agree that the law must be applied, but there is the essence of the law and there's the letter of the law, isn't there? And ultimately, these are people we're talking about. These are individual right. people, and we should be looking at them as an individual. And, and, and in this case, the, the court has upheld yeah. the right, and rightfully so. I mean, out of all of this, of the last week and a half, Chris Phil, do you think... Hostile environment as a policy can possibly survive. Well, if by hostile environment you mean saying that for people who are here illegally, we try and take them back to where they should be and we don't give them access to benefits and things, I think that is actually a reasonable approach. The issue is though, where we... how you treat the people while you work out whether they're here illegally. Because well, we don't know if a random person is here illegally or not. And we've been treating everybody as hostile until we're sure they're allowed here. Now, can that survive or not? Well, I think we need to be much more careful about the way those determinations are made and about the speed. And what the Windrush cases, which are tragic and wrong, do show is that we need to be faster and, in those sort of cases, use a bit more discretion. Now, I had, in all the immigration cases I get as a Croydon MP, and I've probably had about a 1,000 in the last three years, I had one Windrush case before this publicity, and I've had one subsequently. Right. And it was clear to me, looking at that, that a more sympathetic and much okay. quicker approach should have been taken, and that is one lesson I think we can and should learn. I I wonder what both of you think, just in a sentence. That Amber Rudd seemed to not want to use the word hostile environment. She called it compliance environment, I think, uh, Naz. Uh, actually, uh, what, what Amber Rudd said, Rudd said was she still doesn't know all the facts. She still doesn't know whether we've got targets, regional targets, that have contributed to this hostile environment. Her minister didn't know whether he, they had... The, these are things that... Are, uh, there's a lot more to come down the track, as Yvette said today. This isn't the, the last we've heard of Windrush or, indeed, the culture in the Home Office, which has led to this outright, what people have... But, but Nasha, you do, do you accept you've got to have a certain toughness there? You know, if bailiffs were all nice, understanding, sympathetic people, they would never collect any money from anyone they ever visited. Do, what is your policy about how you enforce the border? Well, the thing is, we're not talking about enforcing the border on this, and we're talking about people who were legally invited here, who were British nationals, and actually, what what, what the Home Office has done has trapped them well, with we're indignity. We're trying to work out whether they're British or not, aren't we? That's yes, the, that's yeah. disgraceful. Right. These are people. But you've got to have you've got to work British. out whether people are British or not but at some point, don't you? But, but these are people who were born British. Yeah, okay. These are British nationals right. who were told, and 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 subsequently, they have been trapped. There are people who have had to go to food banks. We heard from a lady today who had to sell her car, who sold belongings, her own belongings, to be able to survive while she was getting, being determined whether she was British or not. So it's in the Windrush this case. This was a British woman. Look, mm. In those Windrush cases, Naz is describing, I completely agree, those right. decisions should have been taken Literally. virtually instantaneously and it's wrong that they weren't. Chris, but, in, but in cases where someone is here illegally, and that is clear, Chris, they, they shouldn't be able to access Chris benefits Phil, or work. The, the really big issue, an interesting issue, is how this wasn't noticed earlier. So, I mean, let's just go through this. So, ten days ago, the government didn't want to meet Caribbean leaders on this. The Foreign Office has known since 2016. The Foreign Office told the Home Office, uh, so they must have known. There must have been Home Office cases. MPs knew and were reporting cases. The Guardian have been reporting it for six months. Um, 
if, if your press office has missed it, the Guardian writer is married to Joe Johnson, who is in the government, for goodness sake, uh, has been, uh, been writing about it. How, it's not the case that the government didn't know about it, is it? It's the case the government knew about it and they thought it didn't matter until the press went haywire over it. No, well, look, it's, really it's, it? it's categorically not the case that the government thinks this doesn't matter. The government thinks it matters hugely and that's why they've responded so quickly after that debate Monday of last week with compensation offers, with a new task force, with cases getting settled yeah, in a matter of weeks. but that's because the press weeks. made a big fuss. They couldn't care when they, they just knew finish, about it in on, private. Finish, could so, but what Amber Rudd said clearly in the Home Affairs Committee today is that she had seen individual cases that were flagged by the press and by the High Commissioner from Jamaica over a period of a few months, but it was only a week and a half ago she realised there was a systemic, systemic issue. Systemic. And I do sort of understand that because I, I've dealt with about probably a thousand immigration cases in my constituency in the last three years, and I've had two Windrush cases, one of which was in the last week. Okay. Now, if you have that sort of, you know, one out of a thousand, you can see why you might conclude there's no systemic issue. That was clearly wrong. Got it. And they've apologised and we're going to fix it. But, but actually, the fact is that the Home Office does not have the system to be able to make them patterns and analogies or no, an individual pick does cases she have you to can. Resign? Does Amber have to but what Amber Rudd has to do is fix her house. And, and not really, moment, you're not calling her for the to moment, resign. At the moment, Diane Abbott has certainly called for her resignation, but this is something that has been historic. Right. This is something that was flagged up. Today we saw the EQI assessment, which was signed off by the ministers uh, in, her, in her department, where all of this was written out in 2015 in a policy document. So these are ministers who are signing off documents without reading them, which okay. impact on communities okay. and people. OK, no, well, it's interesting that you're not, you're not personally saying she has to go now. Look, thank you both. Now, Shari, I want... ...targets you didn't appear to realise existed 24 hours earlier, while sitting on a wafer-thin majority of 346 as Britain's Home Secretary. And that's not even to mention a customs union snafu at a lunch for journalists. Amber Rudd has had better weeks. The question is, will she survive this one to see it through? Asked if she had aspirations to lead the Conservatives, she told the press gallery today she was just thinking of staying in the game. Her position is, of course, complicated by the fact she can't blame her predecessor for past mistakes over the Windrush saga and its fallout. That's the Prime Minister, Theresa May. Nor, indeed, can she actually go without leaving the PM herself exposed and vulnerable. Our political editor, Nick Watt, has this report. If you are a member of the Praetorian Guard, then it is your duty to shield the chief. For Amber Rudd, the burden of the Windrush scandal is falling squarely on her shoulders as she stands in the line of fire to protect her Prime Minister. The Home Secretary is falling foul of Alistair Campbell's mantra. If a political crisis enters a second week, the minister in question is in trouble. Over the last day, Amber Rudd has adopted three positions on whether there are targets for the voluntary removal of illegal migrants. First there were none, then there were some, and finally there will be none. Clarity after this. Targets for removals, when were they set? Uh, we don't have targets for removals. But you did? I, I don't know what, 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 what are you referring we to. We've just to heard from the previous evidence that the Home Office and individual, there are regional targets for net removals. I, have, I didn't hear the testimony. I'm not sure what shape that might be in. But if you're asking me are the numbers of people we expect to be removed, um, that's not how we operate. Amber Rudd has been the Tory left's great hope as a future leader. Those hopes are dimming as the legacy of recent immigration policy, notably under Theresa May, moves from numbers to people. Critics regard this as an overly benign explanation. Either Amber Rudd has driven a hostile environment within the Home Office, following on from her predecessor who passed the Immigration Act of 2014, or she has lost control of her department as she has admitted on numerous occasions throughout the last week that she didn't know vital decisions were being made. The Home Office is known as the graveyard of political careers. In 2004, Beverly Hughes resigned in a row over visas. Why didn't you? You were the minister in charge. Followed two years later by Charles Clark in a scandal over foreign prisoners. Ready to go? Senior Tories say Amber Rudd should not suffer the same fate. I think Amber retains the absolute support of the Conservative Party, absolute support, and the Prime Minister has made that quite plain. 
But to suggest that in some way this is a resigning matter, which is really what you're talking about, is just rubbish. It's not. So I think what matters is that Amber Rudd is allowed to get on and fix this, to get on and do what she knows to be right to do for the Windrush generation, and to very much get on with bringing confidence back into the immigration system. And I'm absolutely confident that she's the right person to do that. So Amber Rudd fights on, but one friend of the Prime Minister expressed astonishment that no alarm bells appeared to ring in the Home Office during the five months that The Guardian reported on the treatment of the Windrush generation. In her time, Theresa May famously ran the Home Office with an iron grip, this Tory told me. But when there was a bushfire, her team would get out the fire extinguishers. For now, Amber Rudd appears to be safe and is protecting Theresa May unless any more damaging information emerges. Well, that was Nick Watt. And joining us now is Andrew Mitchell, the former International Development Secretary. Nice to see you, uh, Andrew Mitchell. Just clear up for this, then, how Amber you know? Rudd uh, could have said yesterday she didn't know of any targets existing, and now those non-existent targets have been axed. How does that make sense? Well, it's, it's, not a, it's not a very satisfactory situation, but what, what I would say is that the Home Office is by far the most difficult department of state in the government. Almost everything lands in the Home Secretary's lap in one way or another. And I think that we're going to see the mettle of Amber Rudd in how she deals with this. Nicholas Soames, I thought, put it extremely well. She's got to be given the space to put this right. The Windrush uh, scandal is awful beyond measure, principally uh, because we're just not like this as a country. Our values are not like this. And so it's now got to be put right, and the skill with which she does that will determine her future. But I don't it think there's any question of her having to resign. It, it does seem to be getting harder for her, not easier, though. I mean, when we don't know whether this is her not knowing or not misleading us, she seems to have lost control of the department. The Windrush saga, we know she knew about some two years ago. I mean, this was made absolutely clear um, that the government as a whole knew about it two years ago. So why would you say it had only come to light four months ago? Well, you know, I don't know uh, the reason for that, but what I do know is that these very difficult squalls happen to governments and to government ministers, and in the Home Office, it's particularly severe. But m my point is, we have to sort this out because of the terrible nature of the Windrush situation, and Amber Rudd is the person who is going to sort it out. I think that th these calls for her resignation are, are um, uh, ridiculous. What we've got to do is to support her, and she's got to sort this out on behalf of the country uh, and, and get it right. Ridiculous because, as Diane Abbott pointed out, she is essentially a human shield for her own Prime Minister, who was her predecessor at the Home Office. Isn't that what's behind this? <laughs> Well, I think that the, this, this crisis does show you what an effective uh, Home Secretary Theresa May was. She was six years at the wicket dealing with a whole series of difficulties. And, uh, you know, I think, the, the, as I say, these crises come quite often in the Home Office, and I think it's a measure of what a successful uh, Home Secretary she was, um, that, uh, that none of them caused her serious trouble. Well, isn't that the point, though? I mean, you call her an effective Home Secretary, but clearly this was all going on whilst Theresa May, now our PM, was the Home Secretary. I mean, it, this whole Windrush saga goes right to the heart of what she called the perception of the nasty party, doesn't it? Well, most people agree with Theresa May when she says that we should bear down in a firm but fair way on illegal immigration. The problem with this is that Windrush was nothing to do with that, and it's got caught up in that. And that is what is so terrible, because it undermines values which Britain has stood for all around the world, which we're respected for. And, and that's, it is that that Windrush has done such terrible damage to. I mean, if you listen to someone like David Lammy, who I thought in the House of Commons, uh, notwithstanding what he said about uh, Tory ministers, but what he said about the scandal of Windrush uh, and its effect on Britain, I thought he was absolutely right. Um, she also seemed to inadvertently make live a debate that the PM herself uh, assumed was closed um, when she started talking about the position on Britain's membership of the customs union. I mean, she has invited speculation that that may now change, hasn't she? 
Well, I think she's cleared that up, but you know, it was, it was Amber's misfortune that she was doing a press gallery lunch today of all days. But you know, I think rather than undermine her, we should all support her. I don't think there's any question whatsoever of her resigning. But and she's got to put this, this right point, now. She's though, well yeah. able to do so, and we must support her to do that. But just on that point, doesn't it um, alert you to the fact that clearly somebody very close to the PM wasn't entirely sure of the PM's mindset now on this question of customs union membership? I, I imagine that uh, Amber Rudd today was very focused indeed on the Home Office issues. She was slightly blindsided by that question, but she very quickly, I think before she'd even left the lunch, corrected it on, on Twitter. Andrew Mitchell, thank you. Thanks for joining us.